Nish loved her daughter. She truly did. But sometimes the rascal drove her up the nearest cliff. Every morning, Pishta had refused to go out, saying that the animals were boring, and that she wanted to watch Trollo or play at the park. Then Pishta got to Reshu Zoo, and Nish found it almost impossible to contain her. One moment she would spend nearly an hour staring at a sleeping Goyuk, and have to be dragged away or hop between exhibits, her wings fluttering, trying desperately to lift her off the ground. Her daughter's adorable little display made the stress melt away, and Nish gently held onto Pissa's shoulders. The animals aren't going anywhere, so slow down, Nish said. I want to see the Fentoru and the Kanadon, said Pista, wriggling out of her mother's grip. We will, but the talk isn't until 3550 anyway, replied Nish. No, I want to see them now, Pista stated, stamping her feet. They'll be hiding. You won't see anything, Nish pointed out. Don't care, want to see them now, Pista replied, slapping her thighs. If we go there now, and after a little while we don't see them, will you wait for the talk? asked Nish. She did not want to go, but the last thing she wanted was for Pista to throw a paddy. Making their way through the crowd, Nish followed the signs until they were outside the Ventoru and Carnadon enclosure. The habitat was a depression, roughly four metres from the ground, and surrounded by electric fencing and a moat at the bottom. All the security was there for a good reason. Ventoro and Carnadon were the highlights of Minigarat, predators from a Class 10 H, the most dangerous killers the planet had to offer. It was not just their strength, speed, toughness, stamina, and formidable animal cunning that made them dangerous, it was their bond. The Ventoro and Carnadon were both widely different species, hailing from the world of Kordultri, that nonetheless had come together to form a mutualistic alliance. The Vetoro were small, nimble predators that hunted in packs, using their teeth and claws to bleed their prey dry. The Carnadon, in contrast, was a hulking behemoth, a towering wall of bone and muscle that could cave in the skull in of all but Kodruti's strongest life forms. So successful had this union been that it had caused a minor extinction event on the three continents the two species inhabited. This had a knock on effect on most of the other animals to become bigger, tougher, faster, or smarter just to keep up. Zoologists were watching all this with bated breath. Some even theorised this would lead to sapiens emergence on the planet in two or three million years, something that had never been documented happening in real time before. As Nish read the screen, all she could think of was how optimistic the scientists were being. She was no pessimist, she did not believe any of the space range species were heading for extinction, but even so, two million years was very ambitious. Nish looked away from the screen to her daughter. Pissa's head swiveled between the enclosure and the screens, each one displayed a different section of the habitat, meaning even if the animals were not in sight, they could still be observed. That was the theory anyway. Both the Ventoru and Carnadon were hiding today. They were both intelligent enough to know when feeding time was, and therefore smart enough not to waste energy until then. I can't see them, Pista pouted. Nish tapped her forehead with two of her hands and said, I know, this is what I told you would happen. If Nish ever met someone who said raising a child was easy, she would punch them right in the face. Nish heard her daughter grunting behind her and turned to see Pista climbing a tree. Get down from there now, Nish ordered. I want to see, Pista replied, scrambling higher into the branches. I told you to get down and I meant it, Nish stated, raising her voice and drawing the attention of a few passers-by. No, Pista retorted, continuing to climb higher. You're going to break your neck. This isn't your suit, everything's heavier here, Nish said, deciding a change in tact in my work. Pista paused for a moment, seemingly taking her mother's words to heart, before discarding them and continuing to climb higher. She could not break her neck after all. Her neck wasn't broken. Nish was done. A little precociousness was good, but this was unacceptable. Pista Grelu will not to thunder. Get down here now, or we are going home and we will never come back, Nish cried, no longer caring who was watching. No, you'll yell at me, Pista cried. Nish hissed in response. I'm yelling at you now. The only difference is that if you come down now, you will still be at the zoo at the end of the day. Pista had known her mother for 12 years, and in that time, she had learned that Nish did not make idle threats. If she said they were going home, they were going home, no matter how much money they would have wasted. Okay, Pista whispered. Fortunately for her, Nish heard it, and her temperament changed from burning anger to mere frustration. Unfortunately, the little Tofana was a little too desperate to avoid her punishment. As she clambered down, she placed too much of her weight on a thin branch, and it snapped. Reacting on the instincts that had been ingrained into her ancestors, the little girl leapt and spread her wings. They began to beat furiously, struggling to overcome Minigarad's gravity. Pista benefited from her youth. She was far lighter than her mother, so she did not reach a speed that would kill her. 
That was the least of Nish's concerns, however, as frustration turned to horror. Nish watched as Pissa's descent saw her fly straight over the electrified fence and into the paddock. Dinosaurs. If there was ever a species in the galaxy that encapsulated what a dinosaur looked like, it was the Ventoru. Another sunny example of convergent evolution if Gabriel ever saw it. Of course there were some differences. Their arms had only two claws instead of three, and their faces were flatter. Gabriel supposed it was what you would get if you got a velociraptor and an alligator, and split the difference. Other than that, rather impressive. The Carnodon, on the other hand, was a true alien. Larger than a polar bear, held up by eight powerful legs, the front four equipped with retractable claws. His back and sides were covered in heavy ostrons and leathery skin, and the underbelly lined with subdermal armour. Well, not true ostrons. The animals did not have bone, but rather a substance like cartilage reinforced with calcium carbonate, not as strong as bone, but still a rigid material. Not that Gabriel had seen them. He got all this information off the interactive boars dotted around the paddock. He had come early to nab a good spot for the feeding and talk. There was no behind the scenes for him with this one. He had even asked and gotten the prompt reply, explaining that Reshu Zhu would not risk anyone's lives with these two fearsome creatures, even for someone of his calibre. Gabriel being a little confused by the response. All he wanted to do was throw some meat into the enclosure alongside the keeper. He had not followed it up, however. They had said no, and it was not high on his priority list. Reading through the information, Gabriel's eye was caught by one particular sentence. Scientists are considering upgrading Quadruti from a habitable world to a deaf world, in light of the new partnership between the two species. Gabriel squinted. No, they weren't because scientists did not use those terms. Deaf world, habitable world, paradise world, those are all tourist designations, a form of shorthand so that a visitor could get a rough idea of how much preparation they would need. The only term scientists used was life bearing or sterile. The class's differences were just too arbitrary to warrant anything so concrete. Every world was habitable to the life that lived on it. Oh well, it's not that important, Gabriel mumbled to himself. He checked his PDA. Still about half an hour until the show. He had been right to come early. A crowd was already forming. He read more information on the animals to pass the time. Ventordu laid eggs, usually in the dens of Carnadon females. Both species would protect one another's young. Only in times of extreme scarcity would the alliance break down. I would either side view the other as potential prey. Ventoru would aid Carnadon by... The screen cut out. An alarm sounded. Letters flashed along the screen saying, Do not panic. Most of the displays continued to display the message, but Gabriel noticed that a few others had switched to monitoring the enclosure. Gabriel was astounded as he saw a little Tofanda desperately flailing in the water. He knew where she was as well. She was inside the paddock. How the hell did she get in there? Gabriel asked himself. To his relief, the kid could swim or rather a control splashing, and she slowly hauled herself onto dry land. The poor thing tried to flap her wings, but they were so saturated with water that she could barely move them, let alone take to the air. Gabriel noticed something in the corner of his eye. Several bushes were rustling, and what's more, the wave of movement was heading directly towards where the girl lay, now panting and coughing. It wasn't just the cameras that had noticed the girl falling, the Ventoro had as well. It must have been the damn alarm that got their attention. If it weren't for that, they would have probably been none the wiser. Gabriel looked desperately at the screens. What are the drones? He asked himself. There should be drones with tasers deployed immediately to keep anyone who fell in safe. They don't have drones, he stated with utter horror. What the fuck is wrong with these people? He added, holding his head. There weren't any keepers around either. They were no doubt scrambling as he spoke, but if even half of what he had learned about the Ventoro was true, the Defana didn't have the luxury of time. Could he do something? He had to try, right? But what? In that instant, an image flashed in his head, and he clutched his chest. Yes, he must try. There was no choice in the matter. If that kid died and he did nothing, Gabriel could never live with himself. Gabriel backed up as far as he could. I hope I can clear it. I hope I don't break my legs, he thought. And with that, he ran at the enclosure fence. <laughs>